kilometers off the shore of Goto City in Nagasaki Prefecture lies an at-sea wind power generator. Generating electricity by simply floating on the surface of the ocean, it can be installed even in deep waters. There are high hopes for it as a form of renewable energy. Today, there is only one floating 2,000 kilowatt wind power generating turbine. In time, we will add eight more of the same type in the area, which will hopefully begin operating in January of 2024. Climate change continues due to the effects of CO2 emissions. This includes abnormal weather and rising sea levels, as well as massive natural disasters. Countries around the world are setting goals on how they can help reduce CO2 emissions. In October 2020, the Japanese government declared that it would strive to become carbon neutral by the year 2050. In 2021, a new strategic energy plan was ratified. This is a breakdown of Japan's total energy generation as of fiscal 2020. The goal is to make renewable energy, which made up 19.8% of the total in 2020, reach roughly double, or 36 to 38%, by 2030. For this planned success, as well as achieving carbon neutrality by 2050, it is important that a well-balanced energy mix of renewable and other energy sources be utilized. Despite its lack of natural resources, how is Japan working to reduce CO2? Let's begin with renewable energy. One of its best known forms is photovoltaic or solar power. However, Japan has limited land with very little of it on even ground and over 70% of it covered in forests. In spite of these obstacles, Japan has found ways to install solar panels wherever it can. The ocean, factories and warehouses, parking lots, convenience stores, shopping malls, and residential homes. Even some farmland is installing solar panels, and plans are being made to put them in even more places. Measures such as these have made Japan rank third in solar power generation behind China and the US. It now has one of the highest rates of flatland utilization in the world. A form of renewable energy that is expected to dramatically increase in Japan is wind power generation. In particular, offshore wind power turbines. About three kilometers off the shore of Choshi City, Chiba Prefecture, is an array of wind power generating turbines. Installed in 2013, they were the first fixed bottom type to be installed domestically. This type of wind turbine that affixes to the sea floor allows for large-scale generators to be installed. 
Here, studies on maintenance methods vital to the durability and sustainability of power generation, as well as technologies needed for the spread of fixed bottom offshore wind turbines are being conducted. Fixed bottom wind power turbines can only be installed on shallow offshore areas. However, Japan has very few shallow coastal areas. Only 7,171 square kilometers are adequate for installation of these offshore turbines, one-eighth of that of the UK's comparable areas. For these reasons, Japan is putting its focus on floating offshore wind turbines. These floating turbines generate power at sea and are held in place by underwater cables. While this limits the size and generation efficiency of the turbines, they can be installed in greater numbers on the ocean. Offshore of Goto City, Nagasaki Prefecture. The country's first floating wind turbine was installed in March of 2016 and has been generating power for commercial use. Floating turbines are very resilient against earthquakes. Fixed bottom turbines are affixed to the seafloor and are still affected by earthquakes. Floating turbines simply ride the waves and can't be damaged by the shaking. Even in the case of a tsunami, they can rise with the waves, which means that they will avoid any major damage. Japan has very few shallow coastlines, so we are working toward making these floating wind turbines that can be used in deep water a clear choice to utilize. Areas for additional wind turbines are being carefully selected in Japan. Now, the floating wind turbines are garnering high hopes to play a key role in the nation's renewable energy supply. However, solar and wind power rely on the weather, making stable power generation a challenge. Because Japan is an island nation, it also cannot share or trade energy with neighboring nations. We spoke to Yamamoto Ryuzo, an energy expert working with committees of government officials, economists, and other energy-related members to overcome these issues. In Europe, for example, the power grids are interconnected. That means that interconnected European countries' power can be managed as a whole. So, if one country uses solar power and might need more energy on a cloudy day, electricity can be sent from another part of the grid. However, there is a limit to the ability to do this in the Japanese archipelago. As a countermeasure, we need more thermal power generation facilities. Thermal power is another necessary tool in stable energy provision. Research and development is now being conducted on new thermal power generation that does not produce CO2. Hekinan Thermal Power Station is one of Japan's largest coal-firing energy plants, located in the Chubu region of Japan. They are currently conducting proof-of-concept tests to generate power by firing coal with a mix of fuel ammonia that contributes 20% heating value. This is because burning ammonia does not release CO2. 
Early tests have gone well, and proof-of-concept tests are a year ahead of schedule to begin burning the co-firing of fuel ammonia with a 20% heating value by 2023. It will be the first large-scale commercial coal-firing power plant to mix this much ammonia in the world. Burning coal mixed with ammonia means that we can still use existing electrical equipment. Mixing in ammonia would normally mean altering burners, installing and attaching tanks to store the ammonia and other measures. However, our method allows us to use basically the same power generation equipment we already have, so we can reduce carbon output quickly and at low cost. Next year, in Unit 4 that you can see over there, we'll conduct the proof-of-concept test for co-firing of fuel ammonia with a 20% heating value, which will prove that we can provide adequately stable power by burning this type of coal. We believe that establishing this mixed burning method will be the linchpin that Japan and the rest of the world needs to further the use of zero emission thermal energy in the future. We hope that we can spread the mixed ammonia coal power that we establish here throughout Asia and contribute to the decarbonization of the entire world. In the late 2020s, Hekinan Thermal Power Station plans to commence commercial operation of the co-firing of fuel ammonia with a 20% heating value. They are planning to burn 100% ammonium by 2040, generating power without releasing any CO2. As with ammonium, Hydrogen does not release CO2 when burned, and measures are underway to mix it with LNG fuel for gas turbines in order to reduce CO2 emissions. At Yoshinoura Thermal Power Station, surveys are being conducted to demonstrate the efficacy of hydrogen power. At the moment, we expect existing gas turbines with no major modifications to the equipment will operate at 30 percent of normal capacity, burning the hydrogen-mixed energy. We are hoping that we can prove the efficacy of hydrogen-mixed fuel in the next few years. This method of power generation, utilizing hydrogen, is already creating great expectations. Hydrogen not only generates power, but is also expected to be utilized in many fields, such as the automotive industry, and is developing equipment to produce it safely is key. This is Fukushima Hydrogen Energy Research Field, FH2R. Here, hydrogen is being manufactured by using electricity to separate water molecules, known as electrolysis. This process, however, requires electricity. Because of this, the grounds are equipped with large-scale solar panels. The electricity they generate is being used to manufacture and store hydrogen. 1,200 normal cubic meters are produced per hour meaning that one day of operation can provide a month's worth of electricity for 150 homes. One of the great merits is that while electricity is difficult to store, hydrogen is not. Stored hydrogen can be shipped in a specialized trailer wherever it is needed at any time. How do we combine renewable energy and hydrogen and package it for public consumption? Creating a use model case for this is extremely important and something that we need to put much thought into. Other points include the verification of the hydrogen manufacturing equipment, improving its efficiency and acquiring trust in the process, then a further scaling up in order to have all the data we could possibly need. We aren't just thinking domestically, but have the entire world in mind as we research and work to implement it into society.
Meanwhile, a new method of separating, collecting, and then trapping CO2 emissions deep underground is also gathering attention, known as CCS. Since 2012, a large-scale demonstration project of CCS has been underway in Tomakomai City, Hokkaido Prefecture. They have been collecting gas containing CO2 from a nearby oil refinery and transporting it via a pipeline. It is then separated into CO2 and other gases. Finally, the CO2 is injected into a well dug deep into the seabed. In the three years since the project began in 2016, a total of 300,000 tons of pressurized CO2 have been sealed away. Monitoring has continued to ensure that none of the CO2 has leaked out into the environment. As a result, we were able to meet our goal of injecting 300,000 tons of CO2 by November of 2019. As part of meeting our goal, we are continuing to monitor the risks to the underground environment and have confirmed that the injected CO2 is staying exactly where we predicted it would stay. I think this was the major takeaway from the demonstration. For this project, a facility for injecting CO2 into the stratum below the seafloor was specially built next to the facility that separates and collects the CO2 meaning that the CO2 could be sent directly to the injection facility via pipeline. However, because CO2-emitting facilities and storage sites will not always be next to each other, transportation tests by ship are now being conducted. March 11, 2011, the Great East Japan earthquake struck. Due to tsunamis caused by the massive earthquake, the Tepco Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant lost all functionality. It couldn't cool its reactor and went into a meltdown, causing an incident in which a hydrogen explosion caused irradiated materials to be scattered throughout the area. Fukushima has been working to decommission the plant ever since. At the time of the incident, protective clothing and full masks were needed throughout the area. However, today only normal work clothes and simple masks are needed in 96% of the area. One of the steps toward decommissioning the plant is to release treated water into the ocean. Nuclear fuel debris that melted through during the accident and hardened is being cooled with water. However, the water becomes contaminated with radioactive materials after contact with the debris. These radioactive materials are removed from the water using a large system known as ALPS. However, the system cannot remove the radioactive substance called tritium. Because of this, ALPS-treated water is being stored in tanks, which now number over 1,000 and will be completely full soon. There is now a plan to dilute this ALPS-treated water with seawater and release it into the ocean in the late spring of 2023.
The International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, has conducted a review of the plan to release the Alps treated water, publicly releasing their report on April 29, 2022. The report states, it was recognized that an enormous amount of analysis was performed by TEPCO for the conduct of the safety assessment. The level of detail, its comprehensive approach, as well as the fact that a large number of potential single failure events were taken into consideration for the development of the design criteria for the discharge of Alps treated water. It also states, it was acknowledged that a comprehensive and detailed analysis was conducted and also noted that the radiological impact on the public was expected to be very low and significantly below the level set by the Japanese regulatory body. A second review is planned in November of 2022. Eleven years after the incident, the Alps treated water now has a path forward. But safety at nuclear power plants must be stricter than ever with many layers of precautions. Recognizing its failures during the Fukushima incident, the Japanese government formed a new Nuclear Power Regulatory Commission to ensure safety at nuclear plants with new regulations. By 2013, the Nuclear Power Regulatory Commission had formulated stricter safety standards for nuclear plants in the case of earthquakes or tsunamis. These included establishing breakwaters against tsunamis, installing special watertight doors to prevent flooding, as well as increasing supplies of emergency power. A new measure added was to help prevent hydrogen explosions. To prevent the hydrogen within the storage casings from exploding, static catalyst hydrogen recombination devices were installed. This prevents a catalyst to reduce the amount of any hydrogen generated. Further, in case of a plane collision or terrorist attack occurring that causes severe damage to the reactor core, electricity must be able to be secured from a location at a safe distance and a cooling facility and facilities for specific severe accident response must be established. Electric power companies in Japan made severe mistakes in handling the Fukushima disaster. The government also learned from its mistakes, and this is how the new regulation standards came to be established. For example, breakwaters to block an oncoming tsunami are now being built at the power plants. If a tsunami were still able to pass over the seawall, watertight doors will prevent flooding. If water still manages to get in despite all this, and the emergency power supply is lost, vehicles that can supply emergency power will be dispatched. In light of our mistakes during the Fukushima accident, we have done everything we can to imagine every scenario, no matter how unlikely and we have built triple and quadruple redundancy precautions accordingly. As part of its energy strategy, Japan plans to continue to utilize nuclear power as necessary on the condition of strict safety, while reducing the nation's demand for nuclear power to 20 to 22 percent by 2030. Japan faces a declining population due to an aging society with a declining birth rate. The population will decline. It was thought that this decrease in population would also lead to a decrease in demand for electricity and energy. However, the use of electricity will only increase as we transition to a decarbonized society by 2050 that does not emit CO2. Then the use of hydrogen as a fuel will increase. That hydrogen will be produced by waste heat from power plants or water electrolysis. Many countries are anticipating that electricity demand will continue to grow as a result.
We need to install the necessary equipment to absorb CO2 from thermal power plants. We also need to begin using hydrogen and ammonia in thermal power plants. We need to also use renewable energy. And finally, we need to use nuclear power. Through the right combination of these and finding the best energy mix, we will be moving toward the decarbonized society we want in 2050. A senior fellow on the Atlantic Council of the United States, who studies energy and environmental policy from a global perspective, Dr. Phyllis Yoshida, had this to say about Japan's energy strategy. I think Japan needs to focus on mapping out many different scenarios, because as we've seen this year with the Ukraine-Russia situation, everything changed to reduce greenhouse gases and mitigate costs and import less, uh, while enhancing sort of the synergies and explaining the synergies between all the low carbon sources, renewables and hydrogen and nuclear. Of course, with the premise of everything being safe. And then lastly, I think Japan has always been a leader internationally in energy. Uh, it needs to keep doing that for nuclear safety, for better electric grids, for benchmarking, for uh, sort of mutual support through the International Energy Agency, etc. Japan has always done that, but I think it needs to recommit to being even stronger in those venues. With the outbreak of violence caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine during a critical time in the development of measures to fight climate change, the world feels unstable. Japan, which relies on imports for the majority of its resources, must ask itself how to secure a stable supply of energy into the future. In order to achieve the goal of carbon neutrality by 2050, while securing stable sources and facing a multitude of hurdles to overcome, measures to find and implement the best energy mix for Japan from among the many methods of power generation are continuing at the speed of hope.